No? So welcome yes, no, to maybe. the unconference part. <laughs> For real. Um, <laughs> are we on? We're going to go. We're live feeding. Um, I'm Jeanette Maester. I really am from WCN. Um, thrilled to be sponsoring the live feed today. Um, we're just going to sort of keep this relatively casual in um, unconference fashion, but I would love to introduce Jonas Bart from Universum, and he's going to moderate our session on what students want and don't want. And we're all going to sort of answer questions and talk, but because there's you know not a huge number of us in the room, if you each want to participate as well, I will bring the WCN mic over to you um, as well, and we'll go from there. So this now I will Your be quiet. lucky day. <laughs> I don't know if others want to introduce themselves as well. Yeah, let's introduce the panel. Uh, my name is Steve Levy. I am a recruiting consultant from everywhere. Cool. Uh, ben Gotkin, I'm a principal consultant with Recruiting Toolbox, a management consulting and training firm. Uh, and in my prior lives, did college recruiting at uh, McGladry, uh, where I was a college strategy recruiting leader. Uh, also at uh, BAE Systems, uh, and then a couple places in between. So uh, college is always kind of near and dear to my heart. My name is Chaim Shapiro. I'm Assistant Director of Career Services at Toro College, so maybe I'll be able to give a little bit more of a college perspective, though I think most of my students don't think I'm hip anymore. That sort of passed me by about 10 years ago, but we'll see what we can do. Yeah, it's the yarmulke effect. <laughs> you know, I have to tell you, that's fine. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> so a little bit about me, and then... Uh, he needs a mic. He needs a mic. Oh, you need a mic. Oh. So a little bit about me and by Universum, and then we're going to kick this off, and basically I'm going to throw out some numbers about some recent statistics, and then uh, we're going to talk about metrics and see what you guys think about uh, metrics when it comes to campus recruiting, and it's going to be interesting to see what you, Steve, has to say about that. But a little bit about Universum, we're a global employee branding firm. We serve about a half a million students around the world every year. Here in the U.S. past year, we served about 70,000 students, and we asked them when they want to work and why, what drives them, what attracts them. So we work with uh, uh, a large part of organizations and help them understand how the students uh, want, uh, what they want from an employer, uh, uh, what they want from a career, everything to help the employer to position himself better in attracting a student or a talent that is a better fit for the organization. Um, so uh, a little bit about uh, uh, an overview of the last study we made was called Communicating with the Talent. Uh, we looked at the number of uh, sources a student are looking for to find uh, information about an employer. Do you guys want to take a guess? It's between 1 and 20, I can say, so don't go overboard. Seven. Any other good guesses? Seven plus or minus two. OK. <laughs> I don't know if you saw my numbers, but it's 7.1. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So there's a lot, of, uh, it's a lot of things that employers today needs to stay on top of, uh, keep track of, and kind of understand. And, and not only that, there's also different levels between which communication channels should you use in different stages of. So we're looking at an awareness, we're looking at consideration, we're looking at desire, and then we're looking at the application piece. Because students today, if they don't know about you, they're never going to go to your career website. So it doesn't matter how good that is. You need to start attracting them in a different way. So before I go into the questions, I can just give you some insight on the last one. So for, um, uh, to induce awareness for uh, students that obviously then don't know about you, it's direct mailings, still strong, university press and student organization publications, and career magazines. Uh, but then if you take it a step further, uh, to, for them to then start to consider you, we're looking at then uh, career magazines, career guides, and also still direct mailings. Um, but then for them to desire you, which means that they really like you and you really have them to start want to work for you, then you're looking at the live webinars. You need to kind of get closer to them and having them to start, really start connecting with you. And then you're coming to the recruitment brochures and the career guidance websites, uh, such as uh, a little bit of uh, Culture Recruiter, Glassdoor, even LinkedIn, I would say. All those that we can actually get some more information, uh, Wetfit, uh, Vault. Um, and then to really start to get them to apply for you, then you're looking at the employer website, then that plays a part. Um, the mobile apps is actually something that students are really starting to use today for that purpose as well, and as well, career affairs. Uh, but if I can go then to the panel a little bit, and once again, this is supposed to be uh, really open, so keep asking, keep talking. Uh, 
Let's start with you, Ben, then, since you actually had an official role at uh, RSM Gladry or McGladry at the time. Uh, how did you use metrics then, or which metrics did you use to determine on which schools, for example, that you guys were going to go after? Well, I mean, you know, typically, uh, if we were tracking success over time at certain schools, we would definitely be looking at our funnel metrics uh, for both intern hires and for full-time hires, uh, starting with the uh, interns or even the, the Pathways program, which was the extern program, we would be looking at how many people, how many students would be, be engaging early on, getting into the extern program, how many of those we were converting to interns, and how many of those we were convert, converting over to full-time hires. Uh, when I started there, in, or I started getting a look at the college uh, recruiting there in probably 2008, 2009, we were going to, I can't remember the number of schools, but it seemed like a lot more than we should. <laughs> Uh, so when we really started looking at it, and I, I imagine it's the same challenge that a lot of you face. You, you, you're probably, there are probably a lot of schools on your list that you go there because, well, in our case, it was a partner that wanted us to go there. Uh, or you know, maybe they you know, had, used to have a really good accounting program, but the, uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the quality of the program hadn't been really looked at solidly in a while. And in some cases, we were going to schools that we simply couldn't compete at. Mm -hmm. And we had to really question, is it, it going to be worth Continuing that investment uh, to continue to, uh, to and how did you like then that. determine which schools you eventually ended up going to? Then? Well, I mean, we had we had some core schools that you know that we that were always going to be uh, the top tier schools, and we knew just we knew anecdotally that we had good success there. But then we were able to get the data to back that up. Uh, the question for us was really where we were going to fill in after that, and you know, what were going to be the tier two schools and. Uh, so the schools that we weren't spending you know, all of our time and effort at, but we still establishing a presence at. And then anything beyond that, we had to question really whether we were going to make any investment in. And, but there were still, still, still some schools uh, that, at, at the Tier 3 level, that we were simply just going to kind of be participating with uh, at the career fair and doing a resume drop and not doing any additional visits because we knew that we were still at least going to get a couple of hires out of there uh, a year, and it wasn't going to be that big of an investment. So it was, you know, we really wanted, we really, you know, we're very, always very focused on that data. And it was, again, there's the funnel metrics, it was the acceptance rates. Uh, we were able to get some quality metrics, uh, particularly uh, uh, for our new associates, six month and one year uh, performance ratings. Uh, but those are harder to get at. Those are always going to be difficult to get at. So are you saying, Ben, at, at some level, your, your college recruiting metrics were the same as your overall recruiting metrics? Well, it's a little different from college in that they were, you had these, uh, you had the externship and the internship program. Uh, and of course, it's also a very, uh, you know, it's a much longer, uh, you know, cycle mm -hmm. as well than, than your typical recruiting goes. So, you know, one of the things that we were starting to get into, but I had left in 2010, is it were uh, metrics around engagement, mm -hmm. uh, you know, particularly uh, since McGladry is not the household name that the big four are, even at some of the schools that we had been at for years, uh, it, you know, how much was social media and you know, some of the things we were getting very aggressively doing starting to have that impact on, uh, on students, particularly as they were moving from uh, sophomore to junior to senior year. And one of the ways we really got to that was actually through uh, surveys. You know, I remember we had one question in the survey in particular, at what point did you actually know who McGladry was yeah. and, and what they did. Uh, so that actually was unique, uh, a little more unique to college, even though we asked similar questions in our experience surveys. Because the life cycle is, is so much more drawn out, that was a really important metric for us. Was, and we were able to move that bar over a period of two or three years from what it used to be oh, about three weeks ago or, four, or a month ago when it, you know, he came to the career fair to, oh, I've known about you for a couple of years now, which makes a big difference. I have a question for the audience. How many of you get involved, are, are right now doing college recruiting for your company? Okay, for the hand, 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 hands that are up, what's your primary metric for assessing whether you're doing well or not so well? Um, we just started. Can I'm from the Mike Bootmark at Mid-Atlantic Region, yeah. so. John, um, oh. <clears throat> Hello. Whole Foods Market, Mid-Atlantic Region, um, which is mostly the D.C., Virginia, Maryland area. Um, we really just have restarted, I guess, since I've come on board, um, our college recruiting efforts. Um, so it's been tough because we do a mix of recruiting at regular universities as well as culinary program universities. So it's a little bit different in terms of how we recruit at both of those. Um, I guess our primary metric is... Um, 
our goal is to get le leadership within the stores and to have people be able to um, go through our internship program, our year-round internship program, and be a successful leader um, sort of at that entry level. So we've had a couple people successfully make it through the training program, and that's what our metric is, I guess. So it's like it's a quality of hire. Quality of hire, absolutely. Um, I could say we're, we're from H&M. Um, we actually just participated in the Universal Survey, yes. So, <laughs> uh, uh, same thing with us. We're actually just rolling out this summer uh, internship program for our in-store. The majority of our staff is in-store. Um, so, we will be then measuring um, intern to hire. Okay. So, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a different metric. Quality of hire, inter funnel, inter -conversion. Inter -conversion. Inter -conversion. Inter -conversion. I'm just curious, does anybody do uh, measure retention or promotion? Well, I think one of the things we want to try is, is I think we're going to, we're going to, we're, that's where we're kind of getting yeah. to. Yeah. Uh, Dylan Schweitzer, Enterprise Holdings. Uh, we probably, we look at three things from the recruiting front, uh, applications, number of applications, seeing if it's going up. We look, of course, at hires, what percentage of our hires are coming from colleges, and we look at intern conversions. And then, of course, we're looking uh, internally at promotions, how long it takes to for someone to get promoted and uh, what source they came from. Okay, so that's, that's a couple of God, mm -hmm. got a couple of metrics there. Okay. Well, well you yeah, almost almost measure everything yeah. there. Well, the quality's you know the quality's harder to get at and it takes patience and you know to really get like you know retention for example you know if, if you're going to a you know an Ivy League school and you're getting a few you know getting ten hires out of there but but eight of them are gone within you know within a year as opposed to going to you know, a state school where you're getting, you know, 10 hires and nine of them are staying, mm -hmm. you know, then, you know, that should give you, you know, that should give you some evidence about, you know, a retro quality. Well, there, there, there's an element there, and this is, you know, that, that's a quality of hire element. Yeah. That's also a quality of leadership, of management mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. metric, too, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which, which are confounding pieces. Yeah. So we do mostly conversion at this point, um, but we also look at our funnel as well. So where is our intern, intern pool coming from? And like of the main pool, how does it get down to hires? But I would love to have, I mean, that would be awesome to have retention and yeah, performance. Just, just one more, just, I'm, I'm just curious, unless true, unless the, the, the labs have some, you know, mysterious, <laughs> mysterious metric. Yeah, I think there is. We'll uh, Kelly Goolsby with KPMG, and I would say ours is very similar. It's, it's the acceptance rate. I think um, we obviously are extending to quality hires, so... Um, I presume, you know, applicants, we get applicants a lot, but it's more of the acceptance rate um, when they're, you know, deciding among all the firms where they actually went to, and then um, intern conversions to full-time. Yeah, the accounting industry all pretty much does it. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, yeah. It's, it's, it's the <laughs> yeah. same. I mean, we, we, do, we do determine our schools based on the next set of metrics, which, you know, uh, performance ratings and um, retention and stuff like that. So that's where we kind of try to focus where we go to school and which campuses we go to because we've seen a better return. Yeah, the, the tie in here, I think the, the piece that's missing, and Ben, you will throw your, your opinion in, I know that, is the part that college recruiter, recruiters have no control over. It's the managers in the organization. And, and, and that impact on quality of hire. Oh, sure. Yeah, at some point you can't blame recruiting for <laughs> the, the, the turnover, right? Yeah, and so, sure, and, and, sure. so and, and, and so as recruiters, we're sort of used to being blamed for the ills of everything. Yeah. Stock price went down, it's recruiting's fault. <laughs> but to that point, though, though, Ben, you said you can't blame recruiting for turnover, right? But at some point, how far can you be asking for the recruiting to or the, the, the town team to really do enough research so they actually find the people that matches up with your value proposition, for example. Yeah. yeah, and I think also, <laughs> I think also one thing I failed to mention earlier was I um, it was a former global COO of campus recruiting at Credit Suisse, and I spent many years at Lehman Brothers in global and regional management campus roles. That's um, what I thought that spell was. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really, <laughs> okay. I'm really a campus recruiter, not a, not, not a techie as I pretend to be at WCN. Um, and one of the things, uh, before Lehman was not Lehman, um, <laughs> Uh, we did, I spent a lot of time working on a, a whole uh, regression analysis of a lot of these points where looking at, you know, who are our hires over a number of years, aging the data, what was the performance, you know, not year one, year two, year three, but figuring out what schools um, are, are performing the best, right? And, you know, it gets a little... Um, 
with you know that's alumni. Funny, that's funny because yeah. schools don't perform the best. Well, I thought candidates, the, uh, candidates, candidates from schools, best. exactly. Well, um, uh, uh, isn't it really the company performing at the schools? It, I mean, you know, it, it, are well, you which putting, is which is true, yeah, which is true. Or you could flip it the, the point, hires. Yeah, at some yeah. point you have to stop blaming the blaming the ex schools. Ex yeah. it, well, ex exactly. I mean, it's really to see. But what we found, and it was you know something that we couldn't you know go and say, oh, the schools candidates who we hired from or students perform much better. Did I, did I do a better job on that Great one? Job. Yes. The bailout worked. Awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and one thing, <laughs> one thing that um, we found was a lot of students that weren't at the core schools um, performed just as well, if not better, than oh, the Harvard right. kids of the that's world. That's magic. You're not a course. Yes. That's magic. I mean, Turo made it. Oh, okay. I just. I set it up for him. That's perfect. Yeah, I couldn't have done that better. But I do work at a school that's not a core school, and we definitely have a lot of students that are very, very talented and do exceptionally well when they get the opportunities. And one of the challenges becomes getting recruitment opportunities for major companies that have their target schools and have their metrics and all those things, and you know they don't sort of see beyond their top 50 or their top 25 schools. And you know one of the strategies that I try to use at Turo, and I know other places try to do it, is build... Uh, besides building a brand is actually to get the alumni as actively involved as possible in the process. So I know people were talking before, well, a president wants us to go to this place or one of the uh, vice presidents wants us to come to recruit here because I went there. There's a lot of value to that because somebody who comes, especially if they're more recent hires, if they come back to a, a school like Turo, I can say they have a real good gauge of the talent that they're viewing for their, from their former peers and they've really been able to recommend very significant um, people and people that actually have done very, very well at their own company. So, you know, for a non-core school, I think that's a very important component of it. Yeah, and I tell you, get, getting to the metrics around that to really again show that you can get just as good, if not better, quality sometimes from those non-core schools. I, the, the misperceptions out there are, are, are amazing. I, I uh, when I was at the MITRE Corporation, uh, we had a big operation up in Boston, and, and they told us, they, you know, we had managers up there that would tell us, I want Ivy League engineers, Ivy League software engineers. Okay, so if like I presented you I a four of Carnegie Mellon yeah. <laughs> software engineer candidate, you would take that over. You would you would take a Brown engineer over a Carnegie Mellon engineer. Really? You know that that that's not. You know you, we got to get beyond that. And you know it's sometimes the credentials. It's not that you know the Ivy League doesn't have good, some good engineering schools, but they're not necessarily the best. Right. And I actually have a client, a client I just started with, who basically told me the same thing. So I think this is kind of a Boston thing, maybe. But they... <laughs> well, it happens down here, man. Yeah, yeah maybe. Really does. Uh, but you know, I think that, you know, when I go back even to, you know, as I worked at a lot of companies that didn't have particularly strong brand, brand names. McGladry was one, BAE Systems, when it became BAE Systems, mm -hmm. and we were going up against Lockheed's and the North of Grumman's and so forth. Uh, and we had our best success very often at those at those smaller second tier schools because you know we didn't have the competition uh, that uh, you know we didn't have to go up against the Lockheeds and the Northrop's and the General Dynamics at a uh, at, at a Lehigh uh, or a um, you know or a, a, a Towson University or something like that which still turned out you know we, we would get top of class candidates. But that that that, that 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 yeah. that's that's the really important to ha important for having analytics that track not just pre-onboarding funnel, pre-onboarding mm -hmm. stats, but, and, and not just 90, 180, one year, but three, five, 10 year if possible. Mm -hmm. And you know, at some point, curve flattens out. You know, the, 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 the snootyism of the degree, mm -hmm. and, the, and, and it, it, it flattens out. Okay. But don't you think that also when you're looking at target schools, I mean, you have a big accounting firm, so I know you're always very into the data. But also in general, no, um, no one's going to hear you unless you speak. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> uh, but do you think that when you're picking your target schools, yes, you're talking about the big schools, you want the top schools, your CEO, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I believe, and, and I see that when I talk to our clients sometimes, that they forget about, and this is where the smaller non core school comes in, that they're, they might not be perceived as good at those schools, so even though the CEO or, or the upper management wants, to work, wants the students from those top schools. Mm -hmm. There's going to be, you know, they might hire a few. They're not going to be the best. They're going to leave the company fairly quick because they are not buying into the value proposition of the company because they're only looking at the data from one side instead of, okay, maybe I should see what these students are thinking about me as an employer because e although it might be the best school in the world on paper, it's the worst match for my organization. Mm -hmm. And I think we do see a lot of employers that don't really think about that because they are, to your point, they want to... Go ahead, Yeah, just if I can. That... Um, 
people choose schools for a lot of different reasons. There's some people who choose schools just based on their reputation. I want to go to an Ivy League school, therefore I'm going to go to one of the Ivy League schools. The people that choose schools for location, you know, a, Turo College happens to have an excellent accounting program. So we have a lot of students that choose Turo specifically for the accounting program. So there's a lot of talent that's available at a lot of these smaller schools that aren't on the radar of the major companies. And I think they're really losing out on a lot of top tier talent and people that do very, very well. Now a lot of students do apply through the system and the applicant tracking systems and the ones that get through do well. But I think you know expanding that relationship and having people who are involved as alumni, especially recent hires that come back and say, these are the people that I think would make great talent to this particular company is a very, very valuable thing for, for companies to do. I, I learned that lesson very, very early in my career. It's actually my first corporate job. This is, I'm going to age myself here, but this is like 1995. I was at James Madison University. Wow. Uh, totally cool. And uh, <laughs> I was with a small company called Branch Electric, electrical product distributor. We were at the job fair. And it was just me. Uh, and I was right across, right across from me was Cooper's and Lager. Uh, you know, pre PwC, and <laughs> so it's little old me, a you know, little tiny company nobody heard of, and Coopers and Library. Well, Coopers had brought back their and you know, accounting firms do this, you know, all the time. This is how they hire their future recruiters, typically, right? They, you know, they send their alumni back, their, you know, their associate tax accounts, their auditors back. So they send about ten of them back, and that ten multiplied to about twenty, to about forty, uh, to at some at one point I was literally like you know back against my booth like this because there was you know they completely taken over in front of me and I was just watching I was like this is brilliant you know this is my first exposure to, to something like that but it become it become this big party but they it was the draw you know the people you know this did, I, I for a while there I I was particularly I think when I was a BAE and I was uh, leading college recruiting there I, I used to joke I had the no gray hair rule you know for going back on campus uh, you know I wanted. Sorry, Steve. Uh, I'll yeah, you there's later. no hair. <laughs> gray hair. There's yeah, you got to. No gray hair, and you must have some hair on, on your head, uh, top of your head. Uh, but you okay, man. <laughs> but it, it, the point being is that I wanted to bring back people that yeah you know, that these students could relate to. And what we were taking back was the uh, middle-aged, you know, dumpy-looking, overweight engineer, uh, which You're honestly just later. didn't click. It didn't click. <laughs> you guys talk as a middle-aged, dumpy-looking person. <laughs> but, but that's a good point, because that's how some of our studies are saying, too. Who do you bring to the students that you want to recruit? Yeah. Uh, I want to bring to them people that they might even still know. Yeah, yeah they went to still know classes also with. that yeah. people that they can relate to, so Absolutely. that people they can ask the right questions to. So yeah. a lot of our clients, and not a lot, but we talk to clients, and we send the best recruiters there. But students, they didn't know about comp. They they will know how many employees you have. They will know if you have a relocation package because most of that is on your websites. But they will not know how the day-to-day -day is uh, right. being an accountant at KPMG or that's being something else. And that's the people they want to bring in. And in some cases, we also see data. They do like when you bring in the senior management to some informal mingles, et cetera, because that's kind of how they get the aspiration, you know, okay, wow, this can be me one day. Is that something you guys agree or disagree on? Or? Yeah, Miguel, at, at, at some point, it has to be a balance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, there has to be, there are two faces of a company. Actually, there are three faces for a com for, for that, that, a, that every company has to show to uh, when, when recruiting on campus. One. It's the face that's like me, you know, sort of like an age age comparison. It's the face that actually knows the business better than the the younger face of the company. It's, you know, sometimes some of us dumpy middle aged gray haired folks um, know something about all the businesses. Now everything ties in. We know pathing issues. Then there is what the customer, the actual the real customer. I mean, the, 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 to provide a good experience for the potential new employee requires a convergence of all three. So they're, so they're you know, getting all the information they need. It's like, and, and, and anyone here been married in the last year or so? You're finding out some things about your spouse that you didn't quite know about? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no comment. Way more awesome than I thought he was. Oh, there you go. This has been very recently. <laughs> very recently. You know, so there, there you know, so you know, there are there are some surprises that you can accept with 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 with, with a marriage, and then there are some about uh, that you probably wish you had known it would have changed your decision. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing with with college. Providing a conversion face is really important, and it's not done. Well, yeah. I, I I think 
that, you know, it, again, in, in my opinion, to have that draw at the front end being the people they can relate to. And as, then, as they get into the process, you know, if I'm coming, if I'm doing on-campus interviews, and yeah, I'm probably, you know, or certainly if they're coming on site, then yeah, absolutely they're going to meet yeah. uh, and spend a lot of time with, with the hiring managers and, and, and uh, get that exposure. Do you based on that in... in, in Mike. <laughs> no, but based on that, because I know the accounting firms are very looking at the data. So they used that. You probably did it in, in, in KPMG. But do you think other firms, like H&M, for example, will you bring uh, store managers to your recruiting efforts? Will you bring your controller? Yeah. Yes. Well, the yes. store manager is probably pretty young, yeah. too, right? <laughs> yeah, get to spend time with various different, from store level to yeah. support positions, field functions. I get to see every single uh, role. Just want to add, you know, I agree with the different faces. You know, I think when you have your CEO go onto a campus, which is, you know, what we did at Lehman, which of course no one wants to talk to him at this point, um, but at Credit Suisse, we brought Brady Dugan on. And, you know, it shows the commitment to the school. And the students want to see that. They want to see that I'm committed to, you know, recruiting from this university and what stronger endorsement than bringing your CEO or a senior business leader. You know, plus, but you still need to supplement to your point with, you know, those kids that just graduated, you know, that are coming back and telling them what it's really like on that day-to-day -day basis. It's, and, and so having, having both and it depends, you know, at the beginning of the season when you're trying to, you know, be the beginning of the funnel, everyone's sort of out there saying, well, what, you know, what's out there? You bring a big name speaker, right? And as they get into the funnel, then personalize it more with those, you know, more recent graduates. And I'm seeing a lot of head shaking, like that's just sort of, sort of, sort of typical. And it's, it's helpful to hear that it matches your research. <laughs> okay. So speaking of the CEOs then. Um, <laughs> Everyone here in the room, I mean, when you work in corporate functions, do you know what your CEO's uh, strategy or what he would or she would like you guys to measure when it comes to your campus recruiting efforts and slash then perhaps employer branding? Do you know what really is important to them? Actually, how's this for a show of hands? I have a mic. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing we know each other. Yeah. <laughs> by, by, tough by, 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 show, by show of hands, how many of you, how many of your CEOs know about, when I mean no, I mean no, capital letters, no, about your campus recruiting efforts. Accounting and enterprise, I would believe yeah. that. I, yeah, I would, I would think so too, yeah. yeah. Talking to massive <laughs> employers, <laughs> college, yeah. <laughs> Our, um, Microphone. Our chairman actually is, is pretty involved, I think, and I, I think that's pretty similar with all of the you know, accounting uh, type of firms. I mean, they come out to campus, and I yeah. think that's the draw that you need to kind of differentiate yourself on campus. I think the branding is already there, so they know that we're one of the big four firms. So I think taking that extra step and bringing someone like with a big name or um, on campus really kind of helps and, and and attracts the students. And then, like you were mentioning, mm -hmm. it's it's that relationship building after that fact that kind of really differentiates and kind of gets them through the rest of the process. So uh, I was blown away. I think it was, it was either 2000 or 2009. Uh, we're glad you got a new CEO. Uh, and the, his first week, uh, he had offices in D.C. and Chicago. And uh, his first week, we were also having our annual intern conference out of uh, west of Chicago. And we invited him, we, we, we invited him to come. We knew that he was an ex-Anderson guy. He was you know, very much tied into college recruiting. Because uh, some of the people that knew him, but we said, hey, you know, if you can break out, you know, come on out here. We did. It was on his third day of work. He came out and spoke in front of 150 interns. You know, completely off the cuff. He okay. still was learning about the company, hardly knew anything, but he wanted to get in front of there. He even led a hokey cheer. That's fair. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, but this was really, really important to him. And then, you know, uh, he followed that up with uh, every year after that, as long as he was there. I don't know if they're still doing this or not, but he would have a board meeting there that same, or a, a executive committee meeting there that same week, and the executive committee members would have lunch with the interns during the intern conference. Uh, you, know, okay. that, it, you know, that was a priority for him, which was wonderful. It's wonderful to have that behind our side. One of the things we do on the career services side, by the way, is prepare our students and interns to speak a little bit differently and how they promote themselves to the different levels of management. So it's much more office-based with their immediate supervisor, a little bit more, you know, the area-based for somebody who might be a supervisor. And then if you're talking to somebody who's a partner, it'd be much more global-based in general again. And to follow up on that, at the career services then, so 
Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> I was trying to be louder. I was hoping that was going to be working, but and then the accent might help. But uh, as a follow up on that, then how do you? Because we talk a lot about differentiation for the em employers. Obviously, everyone is trying to differentiate themselves a lot. But you mentioned there quickly that you're trying to help the students to differentiate themselves. What else do you guys do on that? Because that's kind of interesting. To me, what I think. So you're asking what I do for specific students and how they differentiate themselves. I think you know, the answer to that is really dependent on the student. You know, the metric for career services is the individual success of the student. And some students are the kinds of students who really need to or want to go to a, a KPMG or, or you know, a, a big four accounting firm. Some of them are, are more specifically looking for smaller kinds of enterprises, not an enterprise, but enterprises, smaller places. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. And you know, the idea is to find the right place for the right person. The way they promote themselves is to really figure out what their particular brand is, what their strengths are, and actually match those strengths to the kind of employer that they'll be able to best use them. And how do you match them? So a lot of the research has to be done by the student because you know if I come in there and say I think you'd be perfect for whatever it is, you know that's generally going to go over a student's head and I'll probably be wrong anyway. And not because not not because there's anything wrong with me because again I'm making an assessment based on what I think about somebody and people are so multifaceted and there's so much about people that I can't really make that a full assessment. So the idea is to try and get students a little bit more in touch with themselves as to what their skills are, what their values are, what they enjoy doing, and try to help them find companies that allow them to use those skills in the best possible way. So Haim, are, are you saying then that you follow the career services playbook and that's <laughs> uh, get Myers-Briggs, get strong inventoried, uh, and you can be an INTJ bricklayer? Is this so this? I actually don't follow any playbooks. You probably know that by now. I, but I that, but, but I'll say actually, we actually a term where you actually don't use Myers-Briggs uh, at this point. We actually use more of a facilitative discussion process. Again, under the assumption that people are a lot more multifaceted than you can actually determine from a test. And the idea is really to try to get down to each student. Again, the individual metric is the success of each individual student that walks into my office. When I meet with him or her, my goal is that this person finds employment that would be appropriate for him or her and succeeds in that employment. And you know that's really what we're, go that's what I, we're geared towards. And we're willing to meet with students, continually meet with students to help them get where they need to go. I just want to add, yeah. I actually, um, on the side in all my free time, I actually uh, work at Columbia Business School in their career office as a career coach. I'm a, an alumni of the school. So they, they let me come in as well and do that. Um, and one of the things that we do to prepare students, and it's just build, building on, is um, helping them get their story and pitch right. And why, again, to your point, why they want, why do they want to work for the company? Why are they interested in this, in this industry? And we actually video them. Um, and play it back, and I actually, it's top of mind because I did this two weeks ago uh, with a whole host of, you know, very talented MBA students, but it was amazing having them play back, you know, on the video and, you know, realizing they're not answering the question or they're not, you know, they're not relating to or they're not, you know, why are they interested in marketing and why this company? And so really spending a lot of time coaching them, and that's Because standard. I'm majoring in it? Is it that's no. not enough? It, that's, no. that's, that's not, know, a, it's not and, and the other interesting thing is it's, we're also coaching, and I'm sure you do this with your students as, as well, is making sure that these students, um, it's not just about them. They think it's about them, but of course it's about us as employers. So making sure that that comes through in the interview or when they're talking, which sounds so obvious, but even MBA students yeah. need to be reminded. Well, let me throw one thing, because I, I have one to remember. A um, <laughs> uh, couple of folks here know this, but uh, I'm, I'm involved in, in quite a few uh, Twitter chats for young, early careerists, young careerists. There's Intern Pro on Monday evenings, Job Punch out on Monday evenings crazy open mic career chat on Thursdays, career serve chat, and ad, in, ad nauseum. And yeah, mine's the ad nauseum one, right? The, so, 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 so is mine, so is mine, Heim. Um, but you know, the, 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 the challenge here, and, and this is incumbent upon employers, again, I, I didn't say, I mean, I've run recruiting and career services at a couple of companies, so I have you know, the same uh, uh, way too many years experience as, as Ben does, is, we naturally assume that career services is prepared the kids well enough to be able to move from major to CEO. And we know that that's not the case. You know, so one of the things that, that I like to do is um, I, I ask this in every interview, every, every time I do college stuff, if, um, you know, I want you to, if you were to go around your dorm room, bedroom, house, with a list of, with a paper and a pencil. Make a list of all the things that you like to spend your, your hard earned money on. Give me the name of the product, the brand, and why. Would you want to work 
for any of those companies building those things, making those things. And then you, I always, given that scenario, there's always a big gap between what they're studying and what they say they would like to do. You know, so somewhere along the line, you know, we have to not just market our products and services to them, but we have to also market the career, the, the path, the pathways, and all the different career pathways. Because you don't often get an engineer who moves into human resources. It's kind of weird, you know. You know, it's actually interesting. It's one of the things that we try to do in my office, because we try to be much more of a data-driven office, and especially with the college scorecard coming through. What we're trying to do is not only get the six-month outcomes and the one-year outcomes, but be able to track students who met with career services, what their interactions with career services was, do we work on interviewing, do we work with uh, just their resume, do they go to our career fairs, and then track success based on each of those metrics so we know what we're doing and, you know, and what we're doing well and what things we can use a little bit of improvement on in terms of preparing students. I think to piggyback off of what both of you all are saying, the topic today, I know it's what students like and want, but we should also add the caveat of what they need. Because if you ask a 21-year-old or, you know, what do you want to do for the rest of your life, they're probably going to say, I want to make a difference and change the world. But how do you make that global concept practical for a student and say, okay, here's how you survive the first three years at a job. Here's how you you know, talk with a senior leader and establish a mentorship relationship or something like that. Uh, there should be some intentionality from some source, whether it's the college advisors or from recruiters that come to campuses and say, you know, here's how you make that jump from college senior uh, to that first year, and here's the game plan for the next three years. And beyond that, you know, you're on your own. If you've done what we said, you know, you'll be successful, you'll develop new relationships. Um, but I think we missed that point. Yeah, I think some companies, I've seen some companies out there that do a really good job of that on their website uh, and, and often by telling stories. Uh, and uh, thinking back to my days at McGladry, I was actually thinking just right here in the New York office, uh, had this wonderful experience where we had a group of uh, externs in for a day and they met uh, for a couple, for an hour or two with a bunch of recent associate hires. Uh, we didn't coach these associate hires to say anything in particular. We wanted them to tell their, their honest story. Their honest story actually matched up very well with what we were selling on campus. Uh, and the different, you know, the differentiators. Uh, sorry, KPMG, but they were telling, you know, it would be, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I work uh, in busy season till 10 o'clock. My K, my KPMG roommate gets home at two in the morning. <laughs> yeah, those types of stories. Like, okay, well, and that was really, really, really awesome. But then again, they were also t able to tell about their experiences of what it was like to interact with partners. What it was like, you know, what they, you know, what. Uh, you know, what the team dynamic was and how to work within that dynamic, how to work with those leaders to get yourself noticed and, and, do, and ultimately how, what they've learned in their own experience of how to succeed and move ahead in the organization. I, I think you get directly from, from the mouths of the, of the people that have just recently been through that experience. Yeah, that, that's gold if you can get that. Okay, not that close. Hi, I, uh, my name's Jose Garcia, people engineer. Um, like Steve, I actually went from engineering to HR. Um, to piggyback off of what Mr. Price said in his conversation about what people need, um, one, of, one of the things that I think we don't really incorporate enough in the recruitment process is asking people what their dream is. They may not know what they want to do with the rest of their life, but usually they do have a sense of what their dream is. Uh, there was an article that I was reading yesterday in Forbes about does passion make people more financially successful? And uh, the author who wrote it kind of was at, who te is an adjunct professor, I believe, was saying for some of her students, when she says, when I ask them what they want to do, they can't know. But when she puts certain circumstances, I give you $10 million. Um, I don't care what you do with it. I'm not going to ask you for it back. What would you do? And then it's a very different answer. And usually it relates to what their dream is. And when we know what a person's dream is, that's usually the source of their talent anyway. And this is what multi-level marketing companies like Amway are piggybacking off of. And, these, and there's a lot of people that are growing because of leveraging that dream. So I think that's something that should be considered as part of our recruitment process and how to tie in our opportunities to that.
Yeah, I, I mean, I think getting to passion and motivation is important, but I think there's different ways to get it then. That's it, our next session, by the way, I think, on interviewing. Uh, I think I'll be here to talk about that as well. Uh, so I won't go into detail on that, but I, I think that to get to somebody's passion and motivation, yes, absolutely, you want to get to that. Uh, the dream, I almost feel like, though, that gives somebody an opportunity to kind of potentially BS their way through it. I mean, tell you what yeah. they think you want to hear. Well, it, isn't that always the case? I mean, if, if you're, if, if you're a, an early careerist, um, your 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 goal is to get an early career, and 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 in something that's reasonably aligned with whatever whatever is your study or whatever is your mom and dad want you to do. That was a dig. That's actually part of the point that I wanted to make. You know, one of the things we do that we have two real models in terms of when students come in. Generally, two basic entry points. One is when somebody comes in and is pretty honest that they really don't know what they want to do, and we have a set protocol that we follow in order to help them decide on a career. Again, we never choose for them because that would be inappropriate. We try to get them in touch with what it is that they want to do. The second is when somebody comes in and says, I want to be an accountant. And you say, OK, well, why do you want to be an accountant? Because I like numbers, which is one I've heard more times than I can imagine. Now, by the way, sometimes when you go beneath that, there's some real legitimacy to what they're saying. But a lot of times you get to, well, my father's an accountant. I have an uncle who's an accountant. It sounds good. I don't know that much about it which would be so, uh, uh, really an opportunity to say, OK, let's do some research, informational interviewing, find out more information about these particular places and what accountants do, what an accountant's life, you know, differences between audit and tax, and et cetera. I've got a question for the panel. And uh, I know I'm not the moderator, but it's an unconference. So I figure we can do what we want here. Go for it. Um, Come on, Joey. I'm just so, checking the time. So there's five minutes. So this might be the last one. All right, cool. So and thank you for letting me just you know, steer the program, well. Ramble like on is a yeah. different term. <laughs> so uh, in preparing for this, I found that 21.8 million, there are 21.8 million students that are uh, enrolled in colleges right now. That's 6.5 million more than in 2000. So considering the economy, considering private institutions, for-profit institutions, you have not just the typical student, but you also have people that are going back as a 30-year-old or 40-year-old and getting their bachelor's or getting their uh, master's, PhD. Can you talk to that student and how you would target that student in the recruiting process or um, how they might differ than the 21 year old? Yeah, let me let, let's down the line. Number one, you know, it, uh, th there's a good uh, bulk of those six some odd million, Joey, who are uh, uh, a, a, either changing careers, actually, or they're changing careers, period. Whether they're, whether they're coming out of the military after being in for 20, uh, whether they're, you know, app absolutely changing careers, um, they, they, there are life differences. Mm -hmm. They are at different points in probably relationships, financially, mm -hmm. intellectually, you, you, you name the L-Y. They're, 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 in, they're in different places. Mm -hmm. And it does require a different uh, approach, probably in my opinion, just more, more factual and, and, and brutal, mm -hmm. to be truthful. Uh, you know, this, I know you want to do this, but um, you know, you 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 want to go into uh, you know. I can't even think of anything creative. Something that 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 is a quote younger person's job. There's reality out there. There's a lot of the isms out there, and you know, the the the, the goal as as a career advisor is to tell them this, th these are what the real statistics are. Okay, there is a you know 1.7 percent chance. You, you getting in there, are you willing to take that chance? If you are, I'll support you. I'll show you how to do it. I think it's also personalizing the process as much as possible. So, you know, when you're doing MBA recruiting, the majority of the, I mean, listen, the average age I think of an MBA student is 27, um, you know, five years of work experience. A lot of them are career ch career switchers, PhD students, you know, so they're, they're older, experienced, and, you know, as that pool gets smaller or you're dealing with, you know, an, ol an older student, it's your point, it's, it's personalizing, it's really um, telling them what the real deal is. Oh, you want to be an investment banker? Okay, you know, like, and you're probably telling this to everyone anyway because you're going to work 100 hours. I'm looking at KPMG. Like you're going to work a lot of hours. <laughs> make 100. I know. Well, let's pick on investment banking. <laughs> so a lot of a lot of my clients at WTN are investment banking. So that's my background. Um, but yeah, you're going to work a lot of hours. But as you get more senior, it's going to be more manageable. There'll be travel. And so I think it's just really being open and honest, personally, you know, getting them in touch with with other folks that you know, alumni, and, and what. so a lot of that. You know, not just relying on you know, applications into a black hole, but really having them talk to people. So. A lot of our data, and, and 
my last, and then Ben, you can maybe sum this up. But a lot of data says, yeah, especially after the 2008 financial crisis, they came to us, okay, there's a big pool of talent out there right now yeah. that we don't really know how to communicate to. They came to us for a lot of the student stuff, and they can pinpoint how to communicate directly to you at your university, and you will be like, wow, these guys really made the, an effort. But when it comes to the, then the experienced hires, when they're coming out, yes, they didn't really know how to understand and communicate to them. So we start to look at some studies on that as well. And it's really to your point, they're in a different stage in their life. Uh, they probably have a mortgage already. They cannot have the luxury and be, no, I want to save the world. I want to go overseas and you know work with all of that stuff that maybe we want to do when we go to college because you know everything is open for us. But then when you have two kids, you have a mortgage, then yeah, I still want to save the world, but I still need to pay the mortgage and <laughs> starting on that college yeah. tuition fund. So, yeah. so I mean, it, it's definitely it, it goes in circles. I say, you know, and 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 we're it, everything. Every stage has a different life, and then veterans is a, probably another yeah. completely different thing that you need to look at. So, I really like the personal approach because I really think that's where we need to be. Yeah, yeah I think. The final words from Mr. Oh, Fenn. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I think that to build upon the personal approach, I think it's also that particularly if they're coming out of an MBA program where they likely have had some work experience, they've experienced mm -hmm. some pain. You know, they they they've they've they know probably know much better what they want and what they don't want, uh, what type of work environment, what type of culture they're going to be successful in or maybe not so successful in, mm -hmm. what the relationships are going to be like. They may not know the exact job or the exact company, but they probably know what type of situation that they want to be in. And to be, and to be able to get to understand that and be honest with that uh, candidate, say, you know, either, hey, you know, you're going to be miserable here because you just told me what, you know, what you, you know, you, why you weren't successful, you know, in your previous roles, or you know, hey, you know, this is exactly what you're looking for because this is how we look, and it's t it meshes up exactly with what you're telling me you're motivated by. You know, that's that. If you can get to that, then you're likely on both ends going to get a, a good match. Last, just last. Thing. Anyone here ever been to Universal Studios in Hollywood? Okay. Now, I actually used to live about ten minutes from there in North Hollywood. And I find that place to be absolutely heartbreaking. It's a fun, there's a lot of great stuff to do, but you see a lot of very, very talented people who wanted to be actors and actresses working in roles in Universal Studios are never quite, well, right, they're wearing the Shrek costume, they're doing the tour, they're doing some things that like are acting it. related, but they're not, they have quite made. So the real issue is, again, you know, somebody comes to you and says, I want to be a professional sports player. Obviously, there are several thousand professional sports players in the United States, but the chances of that for any particular individual is very small. And I think you know, the real goal, I think, is really providing information to a particular person. You know, if you want to choose a particular area, just make sure you're going in with your eyes wide open and understand what the field is like, what opportunities really are there, and what you need to do to succeed. That's very cute. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for stopping in. Thank you, Dave.